The featured track for this week is the track called Can God Really Forgive Me? It's a great little track that's out there in the foyer that discusses the uh, grace of God and the examples of God forgiving people who, from the worldly standpoint, would seem uh, that they can't be forgiven. But God is able to forgive anyone who is willing to do what he says to do in order to receive his forgiveness. Good to see everyone here this morning. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, after Jesus had resurrected from the dead, he conquered death. He appeared to his disciples on many different occasions and to his apostles to teach them things further. In Acts chapter 1, we learn that he appeared over a period of about 40 days. And during that time, he says this in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44. He said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Jesus Christ was making it very clear that he came to fulfill the Old Testament. When he uses this threefold division of the Old Testament that was very familiar to his Jewish listeners. The Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. He's basically saying the entire Old Testament. So he further explained to them that the things that were written concerning him must be fulfilled. The things Moses wrote about, they were fulfilled. The things that were found in the Psalms, they were fulfilled. The things that were found in the prophets, they were fulfilled in the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What we're going to do this Sunday morning and next Sunday morning, we're going to look at various prophecies within the book of Isaiah. I titled uh, this uh, series of sermons, The Christ of Isaiah. Next week we will continue it because there, there's just so much to look at in Isaiah. He has been called, that is Isaiah, the Messianic prophet because there is just so much within that major prophet, within that book, concerning the Messiah, his kingdom, and the age in which we live, the things that we enjoy in Christ. Isaiah looked down the time, uh, the corridors of time through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit some 700 years before Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. Isaiah, through the Spirit, made prophecies concerning the Christ. In the series of uh, passages that we're going to look at in Isaiah, they're called the Suffering Servant Passages. They deal with the servant of the Lord. And this servant is referring to Christ, referring to Jesus Christ. Look at Isaiah chapter 42. We will begin there. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 8. Look at verse 1. God is speaking through Isaiah, and he says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold. My elect one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 1. God is speaking, and he's saying, Look, behold, look at my servant. He is the elect one. Some translations might say the chosen one. He is the chosen one, and I delight in him. He says, I put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth ju justice, not to, just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles, to all people. You know, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, 16 and 17, you have the baptism of Christ. You remember the story how he goes to the Jordan River 
where John the Baptist, the forerunner to Christ, is baptizing. He goes to Christ to be baptized, and John says, I need you to be baptizing me. And you're here for me to baptize you. And Jesus said, all righteousness must be fulfilled. And so John baptizes him, and when Christ comes up out of the water, it says, the heavens open, and the Spirit of God came upon Christ in the form of a dove, in the likeness of a dove, and came upon him. That's a fulfillment of Isaiah 42 and verse 1. The Spirit of God came upon him. And from that point on, he began to perform miracles to prove who he claimed to be. The Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And notice also in Isaiah 42 and verse 1, My soul delights in this elect one, God is saying. What was said at the baptism? This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Father speaking from heaven, sending the Holy Spirit upon His Son to empower Him, also speaks from heaven and says, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Look at verse 2, Isaiah 42 and verse 2. He will not cry out, nor raise His voice, nor ca cause His voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed He will not break, and a smoking flax He will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. Verse 2 and 3 seem to be speaking of how that Jesus came into the world to heal broken lives. Lives that were downtrodden. Lives that were broken. He came to heal. His uh, voice uh, not heard in the streets. Him not crying out or raising his voice in context here deals with those who are downtrodden. Those who have been destroyed by the ravages of sin. He did not come to further downtrodden their lives. He came to lift them up. He came to rescue them. He came to give them a better way. To set them free from the bondage of iniquity and transgression. So Christ came as this servant of the Lord to help those who are in distress. To help those who have ruined their life through their own Action of disobedience to God. Isaiah 42 and verse 4. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands shall wait for his law. Christ will not fail in his mission. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He did not fail. He came to do the Father's will and he accomplished that will by dying on the cross and conquering death by his resurrection. He will establish justice in the earth. His word produces justice. And he says here in verse 4, The coastlands shall wait for his law. The coastlands, re referring to the uttermost parts of the earth, will wait for his law. You see, the gospel of Christ is law. It is the law of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 21, the apostle Paul says that we are under law of Christ. We're under the law of Christ. We belong to Him. It is a new covenant. And it was prophesied here that His law would go forth throughout the world. Well, how is that accomplished? Jesus said, you go into all the world, you preach the gospel to every creature. You take this good news, this message of hope, this message of salvation, and you proclaim it to the uttermost parts of the world. That way justice will be in the earth. Look at verse 5, Isaiah 42 and verse 5. Thus says the Lord God, who created the heavens and stretched, out, stretched them out, who spread forth the earth that which, uh, and that which uh, comes from it, who gives breath to the people in it and the spirit to those who walk in it. Here is the Lord making this pronunciation. pronunciation. He is speaking forth this truth concerning His servants. That He is the one who created everything. The heavens, He stretched them out. He created the earth and everything that is in it. And He gives all human life their life. Zechariah 12 and verse 1 tells us that God forms the Spirit in each human being. We are all made in the very image of God. 
Look at verse 6. Isaiah 42 and verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, verse 7, to open blind eyes, to bring out, a prisoner, bring out prisoners from prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. This prophecy speaks of how that Christ would come and he would be uh, a covenant to the people. What did he say when he instituted the Lord's Supper? Something that we're about to, to engage in and we engage in every first day of the week according to the New Testament. This is my blood of the new covenant given for the forgiveness of sins. He gave himself a covenant to the people and is a light to the Gentiles. And that's good news for me and you because probably everyone here is a Gentile. We're not Jewish. We're Gentiles. We're those who are not of Jewish origin. And he is a light to us, verse 7, to open the blind eyes and to set those who are in prison free, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. John chapter 1 and verse 9. John records that was the true light, speaking of Jesus, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Christ is the true light. And that light sets us free. Look at John chapter 9 and verse 5. It says, Jesus says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. In the context there, he was about to open the eyes of someone who was physically blind. But not only did he heal those who were physically blind, but he opened the eyes of those who would look, who would see, who would want to know the truth, who truly desired to want to know God's will and God's Savior. Isaiah 42 and verse 8. I am the Lord. This is my name, or that is my name, some translations might say. Literally what he says, I am Yahweh. This is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, nor my praises to carved images. In contrast to idolatry, in contrast to man's way of fashioning deities or gods by wood or stone or gold or silver, God is saying, I will not be robbed of my glory. He made it very clear that no one was to worship idols or to worship him through an idol. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. And I will not give my glory to any other, nor praise to idols. Verse 8 he speaks of. So in Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 8, we see this servant is declared. He is one in whom God is pleased with. He is one who will be there to heal broken lives, to help those who are oppressed, Help those who are downtrodden, not only with their physical ailments, but more importantly with their spiritual ailments. Jesus was there and he did that. And he was there as a light to the Gentiles. That must have been shocking to the Jewish audience that was hearing Isaiah prophesy this. Because they thought all the glories of the Messianic kingdom would be just for the house of Israel. It would be for everyone, anyone, whosoever will may come and partake of that glorious uh, offer of salvation. Look at Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49, again. Here you have the suffering servant, again, spoken of. And in verse 1, Isaiah 49 and verse 1, Isaiah records, listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples, from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. Here you have the suffering servant speaking. The Christ is speaking here in this passage. And he's saying, you coastlands, you furthest parts of the world, those who are afar, this is a plan that is 
uh, begun all the way back in the womb. The Lord, or Yahweh, has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He's made mention of me. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, the Lord appeared to Joseph, the betrothed to Mary, and said this, Matthew 1 and verse 21, She will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He was given a name before he was born. He was given a name before he was born. And here you have uh, the suffering servant speaking in verse 1. God was aware of this mission that I had. He gave me this mission from my mother's womb. Look at verse 2, Isaiah 49 and verse 2. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver he has hidden me. So after the Messiah is born, after the Christ is born, he is going to preach and he is going to proclaim a message. And his message is going to be powerful because his word is is like a sharp, two-edged sword. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. That means it cuts us open and exposes us for what we really are. Exposes us. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15, speaking in symbolic terms of Christ and the work that he did in, in preaching the message of the gospel, in conquering spiritually, Revelation 19 and verse 15, John saw this image of him and says, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, the Gentiles. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the wine press, wine press of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. Out of his mouth, his words are like a sharp two-edged sword. It's exactly what is being said here in Isaiah 49 and verse 2. Look at verse 3. Isaiah 49 and verse 3. He said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain and have spent my strength for nothing in vain, uh, nothing and in vain, yet surely my just, my just reward is with the Lord and my work with God. Verse 5. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. What you have here in verse 3, you have uh, the servant, you are my servant, O Israel, speaking to the whole nation in whom I am glorified. But in verse 4 it says, I have labored in vain, and I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Israel as a nation served the Lord as the people of God for about 1,500 years. But how often times when you read Hebrew history, how often times they had disappointed the Lord. They had departed from the Lord. Even after warning after warning from His Word from his prophets. Yet it would be through that nation that the servant would come. The Savior would come. That that is being spoken of in verse 5. Who formed me from the womb to be his servant, talking of Christ, to bring Jacob or Israel back to him. That's redemption. So that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord. And my God shall be my strength. Look at verse 6. Indeed, he says, It is uh, too small a thing that you should uh, be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. In other words, to the suffering servant, he's saying, You're not only a savior to the Jews. You're a Savior to the Gentiles. You're a light to the Gentiles. And your salvation shall go to the ends of the earth. Anyone, of any nation, of any background, 
who believes and obeys can benefit from this Savior. Verse 7, For thus the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, the Holy One, to whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors or hates, to the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship. Because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and He has chosen you. Now notice this. We're starting to get into the, the more of the suffering aspect of this servant. It's building up to the suffering aspect of the servant. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, the Holy One, to whom man despises. Later on, it's going to be talking about how the servant, Christ, is despised and rejected of men. Despised and rejected of men. The nation hates. What did John say in John chapter 1? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Came to his own people, and his own people received him not. Yet in verse 7, he is going to be exalted. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship, because the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. Look at verse 8. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. In the day of salvation, I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth. Again, Christ, the Savior, is given as a covenant. He's not only the covenant maker. He is the sacrifice to bring about the covenant. He will bring a covenant so that people on the earth can be restored. They can be redeemed. Also, verse 8, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. Verse 9, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourself. They shall feed along the roads, and their pastures shall be along desolate heights. In other words, he will guide them like a shepherd. John chapter 10. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. They follow me. And I give them eternal life. He will bring them to places that are good for them. Places that are uh, filled with all spiritual Blessings, Ephesians 1 and verse 3, that are found only in Christ. He will cause them to see these things. He will set them free. Say to the prisoners, those who are bound, those who are in prison, go forth. Those who are in darkness, moral darkness, sin, show yourself. John 8 and verse 36, Jesus says, Jesus says Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Freedom. Freedom from sin that's only found in Christ. Look at verse 10. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water he will guide them. Here is where we wind up ultimately. If we continue to follow this servant, this Savior, he will lead us to all spiritual blessings in this life and ultimately lead us to heaven. Revelation chapter 7, verse 16 and 17, almost word for word for what you find here in Isaiah verse uh, 10, uh, 49 and verse 10. Revelation 7, and verse 16 and 17, speaking of those who follow the Lamb, those who follow Christ, here's the victory they have. Revelation 7, 16 and 17. They shall neither hunger anymore or thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. Verse 17, For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That is the heavenly hope this servant of the Lord, this Christ, offers. Verse 11, I will make each of my mountains a road. My high places shall be 
my highways shall be elevated. Verse 12, surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and the west, and these from the land of Sinem. Verse 13, sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break out, break out in singing, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. Here is the salvation that is promised to those who follow this servant. But as we will see next week, for this to be accomplished, the servant must suffer. Suffer for us. So that we can have this hope, this heavenly hope. Christ came into the world so that we might go to a place where there's no more hunger, no more pain, no more, no more sorrow, no more disappointment, no more death, to be in perfect, unhindered fellowship with God. The question is, are you following this servant today? Have you availed yourself of his plan of salvation? Are you being faithful and following Him all the way? And if you follow Him all the way, He will lead you into heaven. If you're not a Christian, believe in Him. Confess Him as the Son of God. Repent of your sins and be baptized, immersed in water, so His blood can take away all of your sins. If you've done that, but you've gone back into darkness, you've gone back into the prison, you're no longer faithful to the Lord, you're no longer obedient to His commandments, you're not free. You're in bondage. Christ can once again set you free. Whatever your needs are, obey Him. The choice is yours while you stand and sing.